We have people still streaming through the door. <laughs> it sounds like the nice first line of a poem somehow. Perfect time for Judy Myers to just come on, I see. <laughs> well, as people arrive, uh, let's greet them with silence as we uh, begin to sit.
in the shared space of silence and stillness as we arrive together we remind ourselves that the foundation in some ways the very essence of um, meditation or maybe part of your practice includes a prayer of some sort the very foundation is a kind of a deep attentiveness, a listening. With your whole being. Not a, a straining or an efforting, but a releasing into the silence and stillness. And with this form of a gentle, receptive attention, this listening, something new can be heard and understood, maybe in a new way, without our minds being too involved. This is the gently turning down the noise of our system so that more subtle signals can be attended to. Whether they feel as if they're coming from deep within or from far away around us. And this can seem sometimes like a reversal of what we ordinarily do, a shift from always asking or expecting or grasping, or the form of hopeful waiting which is really a form of expectation. And we settle into this quiet receptivity of attention and listening with our whole body. And this shift is quite profound and it's part of the essential function of Zazen. to both express the fullness of our essential nature and to listen deeply and receive the world. And express our gratitude and humility for it through our posture and our silence and our quiet attention. It's a dynamic aliveness and silence and stillness. And we affirm that that fullness and that dynamic aliveness as we voice the, uh, the verse of the robe. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, 
thus harmonizing all being. I want to start off with something that's um, in some ways kind of playful, um, uh, but also points to something uh, quite profound as, as I was reflecting on during our sitting time. I hope that was encouraging or um, instructive in some way. <clears throat> as you know, a few weeks ago, I was on Cape Cod and teaching at the Cape Cod Institute. And it's a it's become... Um, kind of another lovely place um, because I've been teaching there for a number of years now and uh, become accustomed to it and uh, Aaron and I can go at certain times. Um, it's been kind of broken up by the pandemic like everything else but one of the first, in fact the first year that I taught there, I can't remember which year it is but maybe 2013 or something like that, <clears throat> We found that uh, Clayton Maxwell, some of you know from Appamata in Austin and have seen her on, on inquiry, that uh, her family often goes to the Cape because uh, Scott, her husband's family, has a house there. And so the very first year we went, uh, we had Clayton and, and Scott over and, uh, and enjoyed meeting them in, in that unique environment. Well, um, they're there right now, and I just got a message from Clayton a couple of days ago with a very brief poem because as you know she is a writer enjoys poetry and um, it was a, a poem that apparently she, she said was on a a playbill from the theater in Wellfleet where they like to go and <clears throat> and it, it speaks to something that I want to uh, I want to reflect on and all of you know, as soon as I say Cape Cod, of course, um, the image of Mary Oliver is right there <laughs> because of her living in Provincetown and all the poems that come from her walks and the ponds and everything like that. So this is the context in which this poem comes to us. And the, the, the poet is Tom uh, Coiner, C-O-I-N-E-R, who's actually an actor who was born in Massachusetts and now is on Broadway and lives in New York. And, but apparently he was probably in this play, I'm guessing, since his poem was on the playbill. Uh, here's the short poem, uh, titled Hello. I'll, I'll read it twice, it's very brief. The animals of New England are lonely since Mary Oliver died. I saw a fox run right up to a car like he had a telegram for the driver. Uh, he didn't, and he didn't want food. Wondering if anyone could understand him without the unnecessary complications of words. The animals of New England are lonely since Mary Oliver died. I saw a fox run right up to a car like he had a telegram for the driver. Uh, he didn't, and he didn't want food. He was wondering if anyone could understand him without the unnecessary complications of words. And I, it's, it's, it's playful in some way, but just like a Mary Oliver poem at the end, it kind of turns on you, right? It's like, oh. And how many of us come to practice thinking we're going to finally understand something. And in the process, finally be understood. You know, there's this deep longing. God, I'm finally going to figure out life. I'm finally going to understand what this is. I'm finally going to understand something that will help me. And in the process, the deep longing to be loved or accepted or known, I'll finally be understood. This understanding and being understood is at the heart of things. 
<clears throat> and some of us come to practice or, you know, we come to whatever uh, hope for a uh, vehicle for freedom, like, you know, therapy or trainings or workshops or yoga, whatever we do, uh, we, we are running up to the car, so to speak, throwing ourselves into practice, hoping for something. looking for uh, the driver, uh, someone who can, who knows the way, or someone who will get us. That, that imagery, I, li I like the image of the little fox running up to the car. I was going to my home one time on the Cape after teaching all morning at the Institute. Uh, we teach until 1230 and then have the afternoon off and I was driving up to Truro, which is just just before you get to, um, to Provincetown, to the house where I was, and there's a little turnaround on the highway, like you do, and go underneath. And when I came underneath and out the other side, all these turkeys ran up to the car. <laughs> I thought, well, what are they doing? They were trying to get across the road, but they looked like they were coming right at me, you know? And you know how turkeys are a little... Um, they don't act like they're the most intelligent creatures sometimes. They're kind of looking around, you know? And I thought about this little fox running up to the car, um, they, they acted like they, they needed to know which way to go, and they did. They found their way. Uh, you know, last week I did speak about this sort of loneliness, being lonely, uh, like the little foxes here. You know, and I jokingly, I think alluded to or even said, you know, Peg and I are dead. We just are not in Austin anymore. But the shifts that people are feeling may sometimes feel like this loneliness that comes from some separation. But it offers new challenges, it offers new opportunities, and I, I spoke quite extensively to that last time. <clears throat> but when something important disappears, because that's the way everything, everything goes, or is no longer available to us in the way we expect it or demand it or come to assume that it will be. What do we do? And this is actually the function of our training. And I use that word, not just practice, but our training. Our training in Zen practice it begins to shape us in ways that assist us in the inevitable ongoing transitional movement of life. And the old stories and the old scriptures and the things that we sometimes reflect on and speak about and use as teaching um, vehicles, including the ancestor stories that we call koans, which I referenced last week also. That's why these things are so important because they defy uh, a simple ease of understanding. They're not, they're not meant to be difficult. The little fox wonders if anyone could understand them without the unnecessary complications of words. And sometimes it seems a little complicated, but it's actually not the complication, which is at the essence. It's that the words take us beyond and, and thwart our small need to be understood in return. It's like if we could understand it really easily, then we would feel understood. It's like it's just a little bit of a comfort. Nothing wrong with comfort. I want it <laughs> as much as anyone. But these stories are asking something more. To asking more of us. Which is of course what Mary Oliver always did. She would take us into nature in a way that was so unusual because we would listen more deeply and feel with our bodies more deeply, like I was asking you to do. And then at the end, she would turn it in a way that was beyond just the simplicity of a naturalistic description of something. And this is why poetry is such a favorite teaching tool of mine too, because, uh, and not just me, but because so many of the women in our ancestors' lineage and the men and the traditional East Asian Taoist and Buddhist stories, they, they were poets. They used this language because it took us further. And, and, you know, you can practice, I can practice for a lifetime, and we're not going to figure things out. 
Let me say that again, because it seems like a silly statement. You can practice and I can practice for an entire lifetime and you're not going to figure things out. We are trying to enter into what is here. What things are. What this fox is seeking. Not trying to figure something out. Trying to enter fully into our lives. Through our bodies. Through what's actually here. And this is the function of the way. Our training assists us. And we have a way. <clears throat> I was listening to a talk uh, recently. And I like to reference these folks um, that I pull things from because there's so many wonderful teachers around. I was listening to a talk, uh, an interview uh, on, on being, which many of you access, I know, um, with Krista Tippett. And she was interviewing Eugene Peterson. Um, I don't know if any of you know who he is, but he's uh, he died a few years ago. And he was a, quite a luminary in, um, he was a, an ordinary guy. He was a pastor of a very small Christian church, but he was an academic scholar also on the side, completely separate from his being a pastor. He's quite an interesting fellow. And anyway, listening to this interview, I was uh, it was just two years before he died at age 85. And he was talking about imagery and poetry, like the little poem that I just shared with you and metaphor. And he says the, the, the imagery and the metaphors are important because they, it means what it says and also it means what it doesn't say. And then this comes together as a little friction which creates an active imagination. Our, our minds open up just like for, in practice. And poets train our minds to hear things and see things that we didn't see or hear before, just like our sitting. And the creative use of language in, in poetry takes us beyond language. Uh, he said in the interview something very interesting, and this is a whole other side thing, but it uh, of the precepts. He said, we cannot be too careful about the words we use. We start out using them and they end up using us. But, you know, that's a whole nother talk and discussion about civil discourse these days and politics and media and everything. The, <clears throat> the powerful language which, you know, Mary Oliver used to assist us and to inspire us and to encourage us and to challenge us. This is what the fox is missing. And here's another quote from, <clears throat> excuse me, from Eugene Peterson, because the language is so unusual. Uh, listen to this. He said, poets tell us what our eyes blurred with too much gawking and our ears dulled with too much chatter miss around and within us. Poets use words to drag us into the depths of reality itself. Poets grab us by the jugular. Far from being cosmetic language, it is intestinal. But you can use exactly the same description for our Zen teachers, right? Those women in the hidden lamp and all the wonderful women that you, and, and the men that we often hear about. You could just change the quotation. Our teachers, our Zen masters, our spiritual friends tell us what our eyes blurred with too much gawking and our ears dulled with too much chatter miss around us and within us. These teachers and friends use words to drag us into the depths of reality itself. Sometimes kicking and screaming, you know. <clears throat> These teachers grab us by the jugular. Far from being a cosmetic language, it's intestinal. It's in our guts. And this kind of deep listening and attending that I was inviting you to in our sitting is the foundation of whatever contemplative practices you engage in, zazen or, or maybe prayer or something else. And this is the way uh, we hear and understand things in a new way. And this, this reversal, instead of grasping for things, we receive them and 
This is the function of zazen. Um, Peterson told a story which I also like because, you know, I've, I shared in my uh, post dharma transmission talk the um, the beautiful uh, yarn uh, from my mother's closet. You know, the red yarn that we and I even shared on Instagram her unfurling um, a knot, which got me the most likes I've ever had on Instagram. <laughs> the little video of my mom untangling something very gently and, and kindly, you know. And Peterson talks about a woman who had a terminal illness that he went to uh, uh, to visit, and she was doing some um, uh, either needlepoint or cruel. Where you know how they have the little you have the frames that stretches the fabric, you know. And they were talking, and she said, "You know, my life now." And she wasn't working any longer. Um, it's funny. I look at Rosemary now when I say this, <laughs> because she had stopped. It wasn't not the diagnosis. She had stopped working, and as she said, "My life is limp. I need something uh, like this frame that gives me definition, that you can stretch it out tight and things begin to fit. I need something." And this is what our practice is for. And this is what Peterson was talking to her about. Our practices give us. They stretch us and so that we fit. Not fit like in, um, like we adapt to things. We fit in our own lives, what we're meant to be. And the, the, the frame is like our forms. Our forms form us. And then it brings forward that which is beyond what we would normally be able to just say in, in, in words, like the fox is saying, can I be understood deeper? And the poet Robert Creeley one time, um, and I, I found this in, in Joan Sutherland's work, he was teaching a class and someone asked him in the class, is that a real poem or did you just make it up yourself? <laughs> Which really is a great question, isn't it? It suggests that a real poem isn't something that you, your small self, constructs. And neither is your life. Is that a real life? Or do you just make it up yourself? And this brings us to something that I've always appreciated uh, once again in my you hear it more in uh, a Christian spiritual direction, this idea of spiritual formation. And there are various, very specific ways it's used. But what I like about it is um, it suggests that there's a seed that is to be attended to. So that it might, you know, flourish. It might have the right conditions for, for opening up and expressing what's inherent in it. But it requires the context. A seed can't become something unless it's also given the right conditions and that's what our practice does uh, providing the appropriate conditions so that what's inherent in us can unfold and blossom and provide fruit which is both nourishing and and um, offers nourishment to others so formation isn't just education it's good to learn stuff of course and it's not therapy but that's useful if there are blocks but it's we are formed through our forms. When we offer ourselves to our forms, that's formation. And we're shaped profoundly in this way. And it also requires, I know I'm kind of broadly going around a number of things here, but I hope it's you understand that, the weaving. And this allows us the stretching, the forms, to, so that we can be honest and we can have integrity, which is a crucial thing these days, isn't it? Honesty and integrity. And I, once again, I'm, I was so inspired by uh, this interview. I'm going to have one more quote from, from Peterson. And there's, uh, it's in theistic language, but once again, you can, you can shift it. It's not, not, it doesn't, it's not required. He says, it's easy to be honest before God with our hallelujahs, somewhat more difficult with our hurts, and almost impossible to be honest before God in the dark emotions of our hate. 
it's easy to be honest before our teachers and with each other and with those we cherish with things that we're celebrating. It's a little bit more difficult with our hearts and uh, our vulnerabilities. I mean, Brene Brown has made an entire career on that one. And it, it's almost impossible to be honest with those we love and those we cherish with the dark emotions of our hate, with the deep shadow. And that's why our forms are crucial and why our precepts are important, not to banish them, but to find a container for them. Because exiling these things sets the conditions to maintain precisely the stuff we come to spiritual life to cure or hope to cure. I use that word because I know it's not exactly what happens. We exile these darker emotions and difficulties, and then we set up exactly the things that bring us to spiritual life in the beginning. Hope this makes sense. And humans try to find transcendence in a lot of ways, as you know. The ecstasy of drugs, um, sex, money, you know, the usual of us have tried. But there's also another one which I think we don't think about is that's the ecstasy of transcendence through crowds, through connecting up with a bunch of other people who believe the same stuff. And that's a difficult one these days, <clears throat> even in our spiritual life. Um, uh, Krista Tippett asked Peterson, how do you church, uh, choose a, a church or a community, a sangha, a spiritual? He says, go to the one closest to you that's the smallest. And she said, why, why would you say that? Smaller rather than bigger, he says, because you have, in a small one, you have to deal with people as they are, and you have to learn how to love them when they're not lovable. You can't hide out. And he also says one of the best things about maturity and formation in spiritual life is to stop using the word spiritual. You're maturing your life, period. You know, becoming spiritual. And to just simply call it spiritual makes it smaller and even uh, cheaper in some ways. It's too easy. It's like the way we use mindfulness now. Like if we use mindfulness, suddenly it's a good thing. You're maturing your life. And once something that's named, and Zen talks about this quite a bit, it's compartmentalized and made into a thing that you can have and manipulate for your own purposes. And it's the opposite of what spirituality is supposedly meant for, or our practice is meant for. This is the little dilemma of the little fox, you know. Everything is spiritual. Everything is sacred. And this is the message of all our ancestors. It is this. It's here. It's now. In this vast, amazing, beautiful, awesome, horrible array. And that was Mary Oliver's message. All of her poems point to that. Where there's no dividing line. This is spiritual. That's not. This place is more spiritual. That one is not. Done well, fully, with integrity. There's no spirituality you can define because it's everything you do and see and everything that you are. And all of our ancestors point to this. And if you don't see this as a possibility, then you're breaking life apart and segmenting your life. You know, Suzuki Roshi said, when asked what is Zen, he said, Zen is when any religion goes beyond itself, including Zen. That's what the little fox is yearning for. What is it that's beyond the thing you can say? <clears throat> and Suzuki Roshi also said, when you are you, Zen is Zen. This is about maturing your life, not becoming a Zen student. Not learning about this stuff. That's not, it's when you are you. And then when Joko was challenged about it, she said, you don't even have to call it Zen. That's not important. Words begin to be too small to reflect the immensity of the reality that we're attempting to come into relationship with. You know, words like enlightenment, God, mindfulness, love, Buddhism, Zen, they become too small. 
being formed allows us to practice when we're not in the Zendo, when we're not in the Buddha Hall, to realize the fullness of Zazen is manifesting in every single moment, no matter where we are. The animals of New England are lonely since Mary Oliver died. I saw a fox run right up to a car like he had a telegram for the driver. He didn't, and he didn't want food. He was wondering if anyone could understand him without the unnecessary complications of words. So here's my question to you in the time we have left, and I want to hear from you. Maybe people I haven't heard from, but anybody. How, are, how do you think you're being formed by your practice? You're being formed all the time by the things that you are practicing. Just look at your life. You'll see what you're practicing, what are the things you do regularly. How are you being formed and how are you being shaped by these practices that we invite you to engage in? Is there some turn there? And how have your relationships with your teachers or spiritual friends shaped and formed you or forming you now? This is, this is what we're inquiring into. How is our practice going to shape us? Now, what are you going to understand or how you can be understood? How are you going to be shaped so that you become a vital Buddha, Buddha living in the world, offering yourself? So I want to hear from you. You heard from me. I've been rambling about all these things which are important to me and um, hopefully they'll resonate inside of you somehow. By the way, when I came on earlier, Jessica said, oh, I see that you're wearing your rock And I said, yeah, I've, I sometimes forget since I'm not in a regular temple, you know, I, but in a teacher's seat, I think it's important to do. And I had a dream last night and Peg and I were uh, about to perform a ceremony. So we had to change our clothing and put on robes. It was a formal ceremony. And I realized I, I had forgotten uh, essential pieces of mine, you know, and so I had to go back to, to get that. So this morning I thought I better put it on, you know, <laughs> it's like Bridget's there. Well, Flip, there you are. Um, I found this very inspiring because I'm on, we're on baby watch, um, waiting for um, my son and his wife's new daughter to arrive. Oh. And it brought me back to those feelings of remembering when I was expecting my second child and I knew it was going to be a, a second son. And of course, it's going to be very unique to be handling and holding a, a new a little girl. And I never had a baby sister. I had a baby brother. I was one of the third of three girls. So I'm really wondering, you know, it's that same pull and push and pull of, can I love another grandchild as much as I love this first one, who's only 18 months old and who's been such a delight. We got to go sliding together last Saturday. And it's just, it's this, it's both, it's both happy and sad feeling this struggle of, um, will I be have the capacity for that? I know, I know it seems strange. It seems strange all those many years ago when I had my second child. So it's, I was just wondering if you can reflect on how that relate. It, it, I feel like that fox that, you know, feels like it's delivering a telegram. Um, <laughs> well, you're, you're stating something that in a very poignant and tender way is not it another example of that edge between the relative and the absolute of the mundane and the sublime, the everyday and what our uh, practices invite us to step beyond. And both have to be um, included for our uh, fullness and our maturity, the growing up and waking up. So let me tell you what I mean by that. When you say, Gosh, I wonder if I have the capacity to love in the way I want to love. Right. Okay. And in some ways the answer is no. Because the, the one you're asking from and about is your s smaller individual self. But the love that is longed for, that can move through you, 
is more vast than you can imagine and has no limits and no bounds. If we step out of our way a little bit and let it move through us. Okay. But if you try to do it from your personality, uh-huh. Um, and what's, what are you noticing inside as I say these things? Well, now I'm smiling. I mean, I started weeping just because it feels, these feelings are so strong. And yet, now when I realize that you say that, you know, I, I can't figure it out. I can't, it's not something I can do. It's something I'm going to feel and embody. And allow. And allow. All right. That's right. That's right. And that, there's no boundary for it. It's so big. And right. some, and you know that. I know that. I've been and deeply that, loved in my own life, so I know that. But the project manager, architect in you, who knows how to define things and create them, which is a beautiful capacity, that's not the part of you that's going to be the one who loves. Good. And every... Um, Every child is different and every relationship is unique. And it's not a matter of, uh, that's, that's like saying, you know, is blue is better than red. Right. They're completely themselves in each of their, their own ways, you know. Right. Give yourself to the love instead of trying to do the loving. Thank you. That is just what I needed to hear. Yeah. Just allow it and don't think of it as something to do, but something to be. In when, relationship you touch, when you touch them and you smell them and yeah. they look in your eyes, yeah. you, you'll you be um, helpless in response. To it. <laughs> <laughs> it will come anyway, right? Yeah, it sounds and great. You know that. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. That's just the, the most beautiful example. It's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And that's how you're being formed, too. You know, that's how we all get formed by each other when we love each other. And we care for each other. Hmm. Do any of you feel surprised by the way that practice f is forming you? It's like, gosh, I didn't think it would be this way. Sometimes that's that's an interesting thing to inquire about. What's happening to me? <laughs> I'm being ruined by my practice. <laughs> Hi, it's when you said I'm being ruined by my practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, that, that voice only comes from the one who wants to cling to the old ways, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I kind of came into this practice thinking that I was going to be all that, that, you know, it's like you've said, you know, to give my, I've had to give up what my idea of peace is, you know, it's like that old Zen and I'm going to be all peaceful and it's going to be, and I was so surprised coming into the practice that that's not what, it, it's not about this kind of peace, but it's a different, it, it, it's about kind of really seeing everything that I do, you know, everything that I get up to. And nobody warned you about that. <laughs> that bit. Well, Maria, if we talked about that up front, then nobody would come. <laughs> you know? So we can't say that. And plus, you wouldn't get it anyway, not in the beginning. Yeah. You begin to. And also, what you're talking about is uh, since I'm making so many references to uh, Christian tradition, you know, my early tradition, there's that line that talks about the peace that surpasses all understanding yeah it's that kind of piece it isn't about understanding something no no and, it, and it's kind of like um i think it was Pema children or somebody said about it's like a, a detoxing from distraction <laughs> you know and, it, and that's what it feels like it's like a, you know you have all these ways to distract yourself from everything or to convince yourself of things or to you know and then what this practice is kind of you really begin to see everything and you can't escape from that you know there's, there's a point where you can keep escaping but there's a point where you can't escape anymore from from what is and from who you are and from what you do and and then really turning towards and and facing that you know well, you, you can escape but it, you have to take a lot more drugs and drink a lot more and 
And I say that it's kind of a dark kind of humor, but it's amazing how often people do their best to make sure that they turn away. And it's painful to watch, of course, and, and to see it because our, this practice does help us, as I said, not try to understand something, but enter into it fully, which you're describing quite beautifully, uh, mm -hmm. so that we can understand what this, what this really is instead of what, the way we want it to be. And that disturbance that the I experience, that disturbance is, can, can make you want to run. And it's kind of coming back, isn't it? And, and really, and I can't remember who said it, but they said, well, my students start to feel disturbed. That's when I'm like, yes, <laughs> I know I'm getting somewhere. That's the it... edge of change, isn't it? Mm. I was talking to, uh, you know, my earliest teacher, John Gladfelt, the therapist that helped raise me pretty much. And um, I was asking him about this very thing one time. And he said, yeah, we live in a culture that elevates excitement over intimacy. Mm. Uh, keep things going, keep things, you know, bubbling, bubbling. Don't ever drop down into just presence. Yeah. Uh, when you enter this practice, that's the invitation and that's what we begin to do. And so the world uh, opens to us in a very, very different way. And it can be a little disturbing in the beginning. And all those parts that are clinging and grasping, we have to attend to with great uh, care and, and generosity and appreciation, as you know. Yeah, it's that compassion, isn't it? You really do have to remember the compassion towards self, you, you know, because without it, it, it you know, it, it's too hard. It, it's too hard. And without each other, it's... Well, it's just a new form of exiling. Yeah. In service to spirituality, you try to put away parts of you that think they're bad. And that gets thwarted too, over and over and over until you can finally say, okay, 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 this is my life, I'll live it, I will. Yeah, and it's the forms, isn't it? I think it's the forms for me that have really helped slow everything down and to meet, you know, you know, the, the bowing, the, all the different forms we have. Making a cup of tea is a form, you know, if we slow down enough and just really meet what we're doing and it and it's kind of really helped me to meet to meet everything differently to meet everything so much slower to actually see things and see me as and other when we begin to see ourselves it, it's amazing how others become more clear we see others more more clearly you know and we're more forgiving there's that's more of a forgiveness that starts to to really happen like a genuine kind of forgiveness not oh i forgive more but a real compassion towards other when you really kind of begin to feel it towards self and, and everything else, like the flowers or whatever it is, you, you're slowing down enough to, to say. So yeah, the forms was a real intrigue. I mean, I hated them. Well, not hated them, that's the wrong word. I couldn't see the purpose. I thought it was a bit silly. Mm -hmm. You know, and then over the years, they've got into my body. Mm -hmm. They've just got into my body and then they've kind of moved out into the world and how that happens is quite incredible yep, it's a shift funny. isn't it it's like what laurie was on about in her intensive that shift from the ordinary mind to this shift to yeah, the, to the mind. Mm. thank you yeah. so much <laughs> beautiful you. expression of what we're talking about <laughs> thank you thank you hi flint hi everybody Hi, Claudine. I didn't want to come and speak, but when you asked, um, are you surprised with something? And that's exactly what happens. I, I've been always a person with so much control, trying to control everything from outside and inside, being frightened of what could happen. Yeah. And it, I begin to feel uh, uh, such a, oh, sorry for my English, because I, I am trying to, to find the words, to surrender, to surrender to life. Yes, absolutely. And the more I surrender, the more I feel that I have confidence in, in life and in me. Mm -hmm. And... 
well. <laughs> and I see in your smile and in your breath and in your body, there's an, there's a potential possibility of more ease in that surrendering. It's not a giving up. No. It's an allowing and not finding no. it. It is as sometimes I, I imagine like a, a sort of flower, like a cylinder in water, and then life can come in and go through. And yes. it's, it's it's so strange for me. It's so not me. And yet, uh, and yet it is it's exactly you. <laughs> Me, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were reminding me of um, what it's like to have a beautiful vase of um, long stem tulips, you know, because they, you, they're they cut, but then they're, they're still alive. And you see them move, depending on the water and the sun. And we think, gosh, I'm, I didn't know that aliveness was there still. And it's on its own. It's so beautiful. So thank you for that description. And the the surrender um, that you're talking about is really an immense relief, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's it. And your English is beautiful. And I'm so thankful to you and to all this community. I share that. Thank you and love you all. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Flynn. Oh, hi, Catherine. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see you and hear you. <laughs> so since you asked, <laughs> I was thinking, what's my response? I think I'm most surprised by a kind of much greater inner freedom that I feel, but much less constrained, much less, uh, much more capacity to respond to what's actually there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Along with something else, which relates to what you talked about at the beginning of your talk. I can't remember what the um minister you referred to how exactly he spoke about the shadow mm -hmm. but going along with this freedom this increased freedom is also that the somehow not letting yourself off so much in terms <laughs> of looking at the shadow yes <laughs> and yeah. sometimes and 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 that's led me to review my life so far mm -hmm. and at times it's it, if i just look at it from the small me that feels i should have been this that and the other it's it's bordering on the intolerable mm -hmm. yes very hard to look and very, very, and very hard to really see um true motivation a really really see see into the nitty gritty of motivation okay. so I, I i'm interested because it's the it's both well, things and you know quite well from uh, your your zen practice but also your akomi training and everything else that the um, the sensitivity of timing and pacing and giving ourselves uh, a lot of uh, uh, patience and kindness to to look a little and then maybe look a little more mm -hmm. and maybe not look alone mm -hmm. that can bring up shame but it also is the counter point to it as well as uh, if I can um, sit with you or hold your hand or be with you say I I'll look with you that can also help but just give ourselves a time mm -hmm. Uh, so that everything is included uh, and, and we move towards as you and I are in the last bit of our life uh, towards the kind of freedom in which nothing is left out. Yes. There, there's a way in which even the internet is expressing it for you today because you keep pausing every few moments. <laughs> I know. And everybody else does apparently as well. Right. And 
but isn't that great? You know, you think about something, it's like, okay, I need to pause for a moment. And then you come back and nothing's really missing. You just needed to pause for a moment. And so it's altogether appropriate, I think. <laughs> I think part of the freedom is give any idea of perfection, any idea of being other than you are, and any yeah. idea of somehow getting a get out for free card from being human. Yep, that's it. So part of the freedom for me is seeing, actually, we're all like this. Yes. <laughs> actually, if yep. we can really fess up, we can see that, yeah, this is, this is part of what it is to be human. Right. This is who we are and this is what we are. So how about we get on with caring for each other? Yeah. And tell the truth. My, my grandmother used to say, tell the truth and shame the devil. <laughs> I, I think there's a, you know, we, I think it's really important that we, we tell the truth to each other as well. About, yes. not about each other, what are not our opinions about each other, but something of what's really what really goes on? There's there's an old phrase, which I think is not unique to this situation I'm about to say, but uh, one of my friends, uh, Betty Holmes, who is uh, such a great bodhisattva at the end of Buddhism in our community for many, many years, she gave me a, a, a piece of stone. It was a piece of uh, marble. It was like a shard of marble that could stand up, very wabi-sabi. And on it was uh, Japanese kanji. You know, it's the kind of thing that you and I love, you know, these beautiful pieces of things, you know. And so I finally asked her what it, what it was. And she said, what it says is, no love without truth, no truth without love. Yeah. Thank you for your deep, ongoing, consistent practice, Catherine. Thank you for being my teacher. Absolutely. <laughs> ah, so let's uh, let's use our voices together uh, as we repeat the four practice principles and remind us of how the heck we we do this thing. You know, <laughs> caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher being just this moment, compassion's way. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering. Holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher. Being just this moment, compassion's way. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering. Holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, Life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. Thank you all for running up to the car. Abamada's programs and facilities are um, because of all of you and your generosity. Um, thank you so much for all that you do and all that you bring. If you'd like to make a donation or a contribution, you can do so on the website. I'm posting that in the chat right now. Uh, and if you'd like to stay on now and uh, enjoy each other, please join Maria on the after the porch, <laughs> after inquiry on the porch. Thanks, everyone. Maria, I will make you host now. <laughs> <laughs>